I'll just give a, a brief introduction. Thanks for the intro, Nick, but I'll just give a little bit of background here. I was in the first the first inaugural class in 2000 at UCF. Some of my professors, I think I saw Dr. Malou in the hall, Mustafa Malou in the hallway, and I was like, hey, and he was like, Damn it. <laughs> and I was like, come and see me. Uh, so it's great to be back on campus. We weren't in a building nearly the size of this large building here, but it's great to see the UCF department, uh, psychology department grow. And I just want to tell you a little bit about the work that we've done. A little bit about, about my background. After graduating, uh, well, really, before I graduated, I got a fellowship from the Educational Testing Service in Princeton, New Jersey, and I was involved in the research and development of the new graduate record exam. After that, I went to IBM, where I was the head of human capital management and global selection for IBM, designing computer adaptive systems cr to create tests for hardware and software engineers around the globe. But my focus was in Asia Pacific. And worked in a few other companies building AI-based technology until I started my own in a joint venture um, between myself, another PhD uh, engineer, and Lumina Datamatics. But then after that project, we moved into LightPayCoin. So this is the project that we're going to talk about today. And Dr. Malua, uh, I, I, I just saw his face. Where did he go? There he, he's right there. He, had cha he, had, he hasn't changed in 20 years. Dude, it's, it's been a... It's, yeah, it's been a very long time. I think, I don't know what course. I don't know if it was Human Factors 1 or 2. I think that was that was probably the course. Let's go with that. My son is over there, actually. My son, the little one, he's sitting over there. The little one. You're a grown man now. <laughs> okay, so definitely nice to reconnect. So I'll talk a little bit about LightPayCoin, the partnership that we have with the University of Central Florida to really help drive this forward. And I'll give my reasons why we're at UCF and why we are interacting and engaging with you, both the students and the professors. Take a picture, take a snapshot, do a selfie, because in my opinion, this is the first day of the greatest time of your life moving forward. I, I, I can talk for like two to three hours. So my grandfather was a Southern Baptist minister and he had the gift of the gab and he just kept going. And my dad had the same thing and I have the same thing too. So I'll try to stay focused and go uh, each topic at a time. So I try to use the PowerPoint to give me that orientation. So with that said, We'll talk about the, the evolution of cryptocurrency. How did it come into being? Uh, we'll talk about some of the, the challenges that led to uh, cryptocurrencies. Then we'll move into the types of cryptocurrencies that exist. Then some of the challenges that we face that hopefully may not be me. It, it may not necessarily be the members that we have on our team currently. It may be one of you that really helps to solve these issues. Um, we'll talk about the LightPayCoin overview, just a little bit about our project, and then we'll discuss Lumina in terms of the work that it does, and at the same time, talk about some of its opportunities. And then we'll open up the floor for any questions, and, um, and we'll interact. And I'm free to have a conversation afterwards, um, and I'll just give a little bit of insight I've been out of this thing called the, the fiat currency or the dollar for a, a few months now, and my life is wonderful. <laughs> Not just, even though we, we've been in a big bear market, it's a totally different world in terms of how I'm experiencing life and seeing things from outside of the perspective of someone who engages in day-to-day -day commerce with a dollar or a credit card. So for, for a moment, just begin to put yourself from a point of view to look at it from the outside and you'll begin to see there are a lot of very, not a lot. We had a black swan event with the Great Recession that really highlighted a lot of things for us. And how, how old are you? How most, by show of hands, how, how many of you are actually experienced the Great Recession as an adult or as an 18 year old? 18 or older at the, at the time at the time when 2008 how many of you were 18 or older okay most of you were still 17 18 not necessarily experience what your parents were or even younger um, experiencing what your parents were experiencing or what your friends and neighbors were experiencing but it was a horrible time it's going, going to go down in the history books is one of the greatest 
economic events ever to occur. As a consequence, if you think about the Great Depression, there were a lot of changes in behavior. We had, say, Social Security Administration come up as a consequence. Now, with the Great Recession, not we had Sarbanes Oxley, other legislation that's that been passed, but at the same time, we're still trying to recover. I think interest rates back then, I bought a house a little, a few years before the recession, and I had pretty decent credit, and basically 6%, that was a good, that was a good rate for a, a home at that point in time. Um, the rate now is around three, four, four-ish percent, a little four and a half, four, four and a half. We still have to reach a level of normalcy where the economy can begin to function. Right now, it's nice and pretty, and the, the, Federal government, they've done some things to keep it in place, but we're still in trouble. Some of you may not necessarily realize the aspects around the quantitative easing, aspects around some inflation, and even, even some of the issues that are beginning to happen outside of the United States with other currencies. Um, we also we see hyperinflation across the globe in different countries at like every other week now. You see what's happening right now in, with the lira in Turkey. You're seeing right, what's happening in Venezuela, and even some evidence of things occurring in other countries such as South Africa. So this economic system as psychologists, we have a role to play in bringing in new technologies for people to adopt. User interfaces, you're not going to find anyone better in terms of being able to design user interfaces than, I, in my opinion, the faculty, staff, and students here at University of Central Florida, hands down. Basically, that's a thumbs up to the faculty, and they just say, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but for the most part, you picked a great institution, and this is one of the reasons why we've chosen University of Central Florida to have this multi-year relationships, because you're one part of many. We still have to get involved in business schools, still have to involve the engineers, the INO psychologists to do the human factors, not the human factors work, but the INO work, human performance, changing systems and implementing those systems within organizations using blockchain-based technologies in general and some perhaps even cryptocurrencies in particular. Uh, light paint, Luna, and then questions. How did it evolve? Um, as I mentioned earlier, we had, you had the Great Recession with that occurred really 2007, December 2007, all the way to June 2009. $7 trillion subprime bubble that popped. In essence, a lot of things that were in place at the time, some regulatory constraints, weren't as strong as they should have been. At the same time, there are aspects of greed, particularly when you begin to look at some of these centralized third-party institutions. And not to make this, I'm not a crypto anarchist, so don't think at the end of the day, I say down with the banks, down with the insurance companies, down with the federal government, and let's run. No, we all get killed that way. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I think there needs to be a balance. Looking at what some of the big banks did and actually talking to some friends and actually family that I knew in terms of when they would go to banks and uh, attempt to apply for a mortgage. I'll say, hey, you could apply for a mortgage. We're going to give you this great rate. So um, how, much do you, how much would you like to put down? So, so I want to be able to put down, say, 1%. They put down the 1%, give them a nice little chart. Say, what would you like, a variable rate mortgage or would you, you like a fixed rate mortgage? Well, I would like to have a variable rate mortgage. Variable rate mortgage, you're going to pay a very small amount in the beginning for your home. And then slowly but surely, you'd have that, the, the amount you're paying each month would balloon to the point where you're paying tens of thousands of dollars a month just for your mortgage. At the same time, the bankers would say, sign, sign, you can get the mortgage, you receive the mortgage, you walk into your home, you set up with your family, and next thing you know, you start receiving these balloon, these, you see these balloon payments coming into place. At the same time, the bankers that sold you that mortgage, they turned around, went to the insurance company, put together all of these mortgages that they sold, went to the insurance company and say, well, you know, we just sold all these mortgages, and guess what? I guarantee you, I would like to bet that they're going to fail. They're telling you, hey, we want you to start your life. We're going to give you a mortgage, give you certain terms and rates. Then they turned around, bundled all of those mortgages, and then had the insurance company, AIG, I can say some, AIG, and said, hey, we're going to bet that all of these mortgages foreclose. And that's what happened. You had families torn apart, individuals getting a divorce. Actually, I know of some 
colleagues, well, through a friend, a friend of a friend who actually committed suicide. Kind of had a family, kids, house being foreclosed upon. That was his way out. Don't think it was the best choice, but that's what happened. <clears throat> At the same time, when the foreclosures were happening, it was the case the banks and the, the went to the government and said, "Hey, we don't. If we're not, if you don't help us get through this, you're going to have an a economic crisis of epic proportions." So they gave the insurance company, the banks money to try to get put some more liquidity back into the system to extend out loans they didn't they didn't the banks did not give out those didn't give out any loans actually they gave out a lot of bonuses but didn't necessarily give out any loans to help to bring some liquidity to the market and stabilize it at the same time <clears throat> the government and banks began to work together in a way in which the banks hey we're going to help you save your home we're going to help you renegotiate your rates at the same time, the, the bog down and the bureaucracy within governments prevented the homeowners from renegotiating their rates while they're getting foreclosures from the banks and their homes are being repossessed by the same banks that extended those loans to them. So all of these properties that they extended and say, hey, yes, it's the case that we bet that they're going to foreclose. The insurance company says, sure, we'll cover that bet. They couldn't cover it, so the government actually had to save the insurance companies as well. The banks went back in and said, we're going to save the people and take on all of this bad debt. We're going to take all of these homes back and put them on our books because it's bad debt. Is it bad debt now? Considering that they sold the house probably 10, 20% more than what it was at the time that they repoed them. At the time, you ruined a lot of people's credit, ruined relationships and families. Although there could be some evidence to suggest, hey, there's some part to blame, but let's put, put some blame. It's, it should be equally distributed. I don't think it's necessarily just one party. There were a variety of different parties at play. And these were what we call now institutions of eroded trust in the sense that they were looking to help, but yet they were not necessarily working in the best interests of the people. Then during this time, right around 2007-ish, it was a person, a group of people, or an intelligent being. There's no evidence to suggest that they're even human, considering that it was only email communication that was taking place. Right now, you may say, well, DBU, you, you're out there. It's kind of crazy. Um, they couldn't be an alien. But right now, there's no evidence to dispute the claim. I used to, I was a federal investigator for the United States Office of Personnel Management after I got out of the military. I was the, the, the top investigator coming out of that class at that point in time. And I did research for or investigations on CIA, DEA, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, Department of Defense, Department of Energy. If you were coming into government and were getting a clearance, for instance, some of you moving into Lockheed Martin, you may need clearances. If doing an SSBI investigation, I'd be that one to interview you, dig into your life to collect that evidence. And right now, there's no evidence to collect to, to suggest that this person was even human. But yet, you do have these electronic communications by email taking place. But that's just out there. I could be totally crazy. Call me a quackpot. You can. But that's totally fine. Being called a quack, I'm still being called a quackpot. But he wrote a paper, or she wrote a paper, or they wrote a paper, or it wrote a paper. And there's technology where actually text can be written by computer. There's a lot of evidence suggesting that. And to this day, um, the, the white paper. The white paper. It, it was. It, no, no. It actually it wasn't. There were several cryptocurrencies. If you look in the research in the crypto in the cryptography space, there were different coins that came out, but they were unable to solve this problem related to double spending, in the sense where if I have five dollars and I decide, and what's your name, ma'am? Edgem. Okay, and I gave Edgem five dollars electronically. Who's to say, or what system do we have in place, if I send her, I can write some code and have $5 send it to her and have $5 and send it to you, even though it's the case. I only have $5, but yet there's really $10 that has been given out. There needs to be some system in which you prevent that double spending. So, in this, the, the paper by Satoshi Nakamoto, and that's what we'll call this entity, um, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, 
it was at the point that it makes the proposal to solve the issue of removing third parties from the system to prevent such a black swan event like in 2008 from occurring ever again. Let's remove the banks to some degree. Let's remove some of the parties who monitor, moni monitor funds being transferred amongst individuals. You do, you do right now, if you were to go to the bank and you send over $10,000, the bank has an obligation to report to the government, hey, this person's sending, wiring $10,000 into, into your personal business about transactions. I'm a privacy guy. Um, for some folks, 1776, for me, it's 1865. But for the most part, you really pride privacy. And, and I pride my privacy. There shouldn't be another party monitoring in terms of what I do with another individual. We used to uh, sell cars and we'd have to report if somebody paid 10000 yeah, and that happened to Kate. That happened to me. When I used, I cashed out Bitcoin, bought a vehicle, and they said, well, we, we still have to report to the government in terms of who's and you doing this transaction all cash. <clears throat> but once again, true identity um, is unknown of Satoshi, Satoshi Nakamoto. And the investigation is still open. They're still looking for this, this person, place, thing, man, or woman. That's the, that's the humor part of this presentation. We don't know who it is at the end of the day. And if any of you have any evidence to suggest who the person might be, let me know. I'm still looking. Um, they pro propose Bitcoin. Bitcoin is once again solved the double spend issue. It's open, it's decentralized, it's peer to peer, and it's not censored. Quick question. Yeah, just uh, if you could maybe like just kind of the beginning, because probably a lot of people don't, aren't familiar with cryptocurrency like at all, like what sure. it is, like kind of how generally like broad view it works. Sure. So the way it would work, say for instance, we have three chairs. Or three machines and these machines they're going to be in a network at least three they're in a network consider them all as equal or peers there's a transaction for instance I'm going to walk this through physically there's a transaction where initially there's this thing that's created called a genesis block a genesis block if you think about genesis it's the first block so you have a block of transactions where you set up the peer nodes, the initial set of peer nodes. One, two, three. A transaction is set to be entered into a block. And that block may be two megabytes and maybe 32 mega megabytes. But yet transactions are stored in that block. Now, it's the case that the first transaction is that transaction is sent and it's broadcast across this network of three that transaction is being placed into a block. Now, there has to be some level of consensus that yes, this is a valid transaction. So everyone has the, the transaction that's placed in. More transactions are placed in until the block is full or the time has elapsed, say one minute or 10 minutes in the case of Bitcoin, the transactions are all placed and now a block is created and they have, no, they have to be able to verify the transactions. They verify the transactions through a consensus process called proof of work. With proof of work, the way it, it works, once the transactions say, okay, now we have to solve this particular puzzle to come to consensus. They're using, now I'll mention it later, the application specific integrated circuit. They're using a computer to solve a very complex math problem. All three of these computers in the network, they have the transactions, the set of transactions, and they're saying, we want to ver verify the transactions, but you have to solve the puzzle to be able to verify the transactions. So all, this computer is using resources to find the, the answer to the math problem. This computer is doing the same, trying to fault. Whoever solves that math problem first says, hey, I'm the winner. I solved the math problem. And then here's the key. They broadcast the key out. This computer says, uh, let me see. Let me put the key in, turn the lock. Yeah, it works. This one puts it in. Yeah, it works. Uh, thumbs up. Because this computer found the math problem first, it gets a reward from the network. And at that point, it, it puts the block on a chain. Right now, it's the Genesis block. So now you have that first block. And it creates the next block. So now you have another block of open transactions that can be filled within that particular block. Now more and more trans and the process repeats, repeats, and that whoever solves the problem the second time, they get the reward and that first block that's immutable, it can't be changed, and another block is placed on it. Now you have a block chain, an immutable set of blocks. 
Right now, the instance that we're doing with is just within currency, but it, but it can be any, almost anything that can be cryptographically secure in terms of digitized information. So does that, does that make sense in terms of creating a block chain? You're just adding on immutable sets of blocks to previous transactions that are being encrypted. And the value of the currency is limited by the mathematical uh, computation. It, the currency is limited by the how how many coins are designated at the at the outset of the deployment of the code. So, and, but there can be you can fork the code and make some edits edit to it at, to make some modifications in terms instead of twenty one million supply like in Bitcoin you can do forty two million or thirty two and it just depends on what the programmer is thinking at this point. Shitoshi Nakamoto thought of of twenty one million, so it, it's programmable. So hopefully that makes sense in terms of what a, a, a blockchain is. That's, and that's very high level. Um, it's just a set of immutable blocks of transactions that are cryptographically hashed. It's, it's hashed and encrypted and it cannot be changed. So it's a permanent record. Um, so solving the double, the double spend problem, that was the case of, of Bitcoin. And I think there should be a, a, a Nobel Prize in economics for that discovery, but I don't think it will be awarded to anyone. I think it should just let us all pay our taxes in the reward distributed amongst everybody in America and across the world. But anyway, I think it's worthy of a, of a Nobel Prize. That's in my opinion, but who are we going to give it to? Um, it's open, decentralized, immutable, censorship resistant, permissionless, and it's trustless. You don't have to trust the the <laughs> network you trust the software you trust the mathematics the proofs that are behind the development of the system itself it's the case the math is math is math um, considering my my academic grandfather um i know you're one of my academic fathers but it's the case my academic grandfather was john tukey and basically he was the guy who actually invented the term software john tukey basically said the thing about being a statistician is that you get to play in everybody's backyard, and this is a wonderful backyard to be in at this point. But the math in terms of cryptocurrencies and cryptography, elliptical curve cryptography, I think is absolutely wonderful. Um, and I think it's a great application of mathematics in terms of helping moving our technology, moving our society forward. Um, as I mentioned earlier, application-specific integrated circuits, or ASICs, they protect the network using the proof-of-work algorithm. But there are many consensus algorithms that come into play. And see 1,900 cryptocurrencies. Our project is only three months old, um, but we're already in the top 20% of all cryptocurrency projects in the world. In terms of masternodes only, which is a special type of cryptocurrency, um, we're in the top 1% in less than three months. Because we have a solid team, we have a solid economic model, and we have a solid community in place. But once again, we need to have a lot of research and development around this because this developed out in the wild. Now the governments are attempting to bring it in, the SEC trying to put some regulations around it. At the same time, there's not a lot of research and development in a wide variety of different spaces. Cryptography is solid, nice research. Computer science, there's research. Human factors in terms of development of the wallets. The wallets suck, but I'll get to, get to that when we talk a little bit later. But LightPay coins ranking in light in the coin market cap, we're in the top 20%. And masternodes online, we're in the top 1%. Um, number two or number number three, number four, depending on the day. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the different types of cryptocurrencies can be described by the the type of of consensus algorithm. You have proof of work solving a very complex math problem. You have proof of stake. If you have money within the network or coins within the network and you want to stake your currency, you can put your currency up within the network to say, I will make sure that this is a valid transaction by putting my funds up or staking. If it's the case within the network, everyone's able to confirm either well, in Bitcoin is say six confirmations within our network is 71 confirmations at one minute per confirmation. Then that staker receives a reward for staking their currency. There is a proof of elapsed time, which is a, a, a not often used in terms of a consensus algorithm, kind of funky in the sense that each there's, there are computers in the network. Each one of the computers in the network, when there's a block that needs to be, block of transaction needs to be confirmed, they run a function of sleep. All of the computers go to sleep, and the time that each of those computers go to sleep 
it's the case, it's random by each one of the computers. Whatever computer wakes up first, <coughs> receives a reward. You say, okay, I was up first. You receive the reward, you met the block, then it moves forward. That's another consensus algorithm. And the one that we use within our network, we actually use two, proof of stake, and we also use um, a zero knowledge proof. And this is more for uh, dark currencies or not, let me not say dark currencies, but privacy currencies, the one where you like to anonymize, tran make transactions anonymous. And it's in the sense that the prover and the challenger, the, or the prover and the verifier, they know nothing about each other at all except information about the transaction itself. Imagine a hotel, imagine a hotel with two rooms and within the, the two rooms there's a door between the two rooms in addition to the door entering out going into the hallway. The prover says I have these set of transactions I want to verify that these transactions are actually valid. Now if the person on, or the system on the other side knows absolutely nothing about the other system within, with it, whom it's interacting. It's going to say, I have the code to know about, and, and I know information about this transaction. Now, the prover says, the prover says, come out of door A. If the initial verifier is on, in room B, excuse me, room B, it can unlock that door in the hotel room, go to the other side, unlock it and say, door open, shut. Now, give me another test. You have a 50-50 chance of getting it right, but sampling, say 20 times or 100 times, you approach asymptotic normality and say, what's the probability that this person or this system knows about the transaction considering the, the extent that they are able to open and close these different doors on request of this, this prover. The verifier is able to open those. It's kind of complex proof, but yet it, it's able to allow for transactions to become anonymous, which is another thing Bitcoin is not able to do. All right, um, it's primarily used with master nodes, um, knowing nothing. It introduces fungibility and anonymity. When we talk about fungibility, um, just briefly, um, every unit within a, a currency, like levels of measurement, interval units, you know, in a, any unit can be replaced or the level of measurement, the unit between every other unit is equal. Thus, if you have two units of something, it's same as one unit of X, one unit of, one unit of X x2 so it's interchangeable but if it's the case I have a million dollars I give you a million dollars but at the same time I just got finished for the sake of discussion using that million dollars to buy donuts and I have donut dust all over this this one million dollars I give it to you it's like I don't like donut dust um, I'm not going to take that a million dollars off those well, <laughs> now is at the same time there's somebody watching us to know that I'm giving you a million dollars with donut dust. Replace donut dust with what you like, and for, at that point you lose aspects of fungibility because people are like I'm not going to take that donut dust. It has donut dust on it. If most of you pulled out your dollar bills and had it scanned, you see that it has cocaine on it. That's a whole nother issue, but we don't even think about the the issues related to fungibility of currency. <clears throat> now, with Bitcoin, you can track transactions on the blockchain. Because you can track those transactions on the blockchain, it loses the aspects of, of, of fungib fungibility. But with zero proof um, and being able to make transactions anonymous, you reintroduce fungibility. Uh, some of the industry challenges, hey, this is where you perk up because you're like, how do I bring my skills to the table to bring uh, the cryptocurrency into mainstream, Because which is one of my goals. Um, Bitcoin transaction speed is around seven transactions per second. That sucks. That, that sucks. At the same time, industrial speed, when you look at Visa, 24,000 transactions per second. Considering the fact that the miners in the Bitcoin network using proof of work, the energy that they consume is about 
as it has a, a, a consumption footprint as large as a small country. Think about the consumption footprint of Visa right now running all of those servers to be able to produce 24,000 transactions per second. Now that's why you have some of these next generation consensus algorithms coming into play that do not require that very heavy footprint. But I think Satoshi Nakamoto made a, a, a decent decision in the beginning where you have to do a lot of work to penetrate the network. <clears throat> Scalability. Um, right now, I, I, by a show of hands, how many of you actually use uh, cryptocurrency or have possessed cryptocurrency at least? Well, no one. The evidence would suggest that 15% um, of you own crypto. You're just not saying it. <laughs> and these are students uses, using scholarship money, student loan money to buy crypto. It's crazy, but it's happening. Um, at the same time, that's the issue with Bitcoin. Also, there's a, one big issue with uh, Ethereum, which was supposed to be a platform on which other cryptocurrencies could launch. Uh, they actually had a clock with one application called CryptoKitties, where you can buy these, these cryptographically secure kitty cats. And some have sold for tens of thousands of dollars. But yet, there were so many kitty cats and transactions on the network, it crashed the Ethereum network, which was crazy. I'm like, if you crash on a kitty, that what crashes the internet all the time. It's, it's pictures of kitty cats. This was a weird obsession, um, but it happens. Um, anonymity, you think about privacy and fungibility, some of the other cryptocurrencies like Monero, like Dash, like Litecoin, we begin to address some of those issues. User interfaces, there are several types of wallets where there are several there are serious problems, particularly when you talk about cold wallets, warm wallets, and hot wallets. Cold wallets, they're offline, these, these nice little, they're about the size of a flash drive, you have to put in these nice little code, and it sucks to be able to, to use this offline interface, you plug it in, it has a plug in the Mozilla, this is 1994 all over again. If some of you, uh, I'll call you OG human factors professors, remember the first part of the internet, having it was a Linux box sending to an IP address back and forth, but it, you didn't have those URLs. It was an ugly internet. Anyone knows the purpose? Does anyone know the purpose of the internet? Department of Defense. The purpose of it was founded. Yeah, found it. Found it by DARPA. DARPANET. But the goal of the internet itself was to be a communication channel, a decentralized communication channel under the circumstance that there was a nuclear attack. So it was designed for the purpose of self-defense and communication, to facilitate communication. Now, Bitcoin is beginning to move in, that, in the same spirit where it is decentralized, it is open, no one controls it. That's why, in my opinion, I think this is one of, it's bigger than, I would say it's bigger than the internet. It's bigger than the internet in terms of how it's going to change our lives. Um, but think about it. Right now, the interfaces really, really suck. Think about all the, in 1994, you had about, you had about 2,300 websites that were on the web. In terms of cryptocurrencies, we have about 1,900 plus, plus or minus, depending on their market cap, to even be listed on coinmarketcap.com. Right now, we're only at, like I said, a, little, a few thousand. I think we're going to be in the millions. People are going to say, hey, there's going to be a bubble pop and there's only be two or three left. That's exactly what they said about the internet. There's only going to be two or three websites. Uh, no. It's going to be much bigger than what folks expect, expect but that goes back to a, 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 a behavioral economic bias that most of us have. Also, point of sale devices for businesses. Um, that's another challenge that's in place. Mass adoption. Um, how do you begin to shape the attitudes and about cryptocurrencies. Even though it's the case that a lot of people are so far removed from what happened that spurred this industry on, you mentioned cryptocurrencies. Oh no, drug dealers use that, arms dealers and pedophile folks, they use that. But no, it was developed as a consequence of a global financial economic crisis. But yet it's the case you're beginning to see some of the characteristics of Bitcoin begin to perform similar to commodities. When you think about soybean, when you think about silver, when you think about gold, what happens when the, the, the dollar, as compared to currencies around the world, what happens to the price of gold when the dollar goes down? Gold goes up. Gold goes up. S same thing when you look at the other commodities as well. Go look at the decision, uh, not decision, but the most recent news about interest rates. When interest rates, when news hit that the feds were going to increase re interest rates, Bitcoin shot through a, a key resistance point of over $7,000. 
which it's now that we should begin to take into consideration. And this, this, this needs to be studied, um, all of the aspects around cryptocurrencies. The people are trying to scare you out of it for the most part. I know I'm running out of time here, and I'm going to see if I can wrap up in a couple more minutes here to, to have some questions and answers and bring Patrick on myself, because I'm, like I said, I'm a yapper. Um, people are trying to scare you. I don't know if most of you remember the Rothschild scare, how the Rothschilds made most of their money off the, the bank of, of England. It was a case that they, during the, they funded the Napoleonic War, they funded the, the British and found out that Napoleon was going to lose. They said, they went back to the British government, hey, Napoleon's going to say, Napoleon's going to lose the war, you're going to win. The British basically said, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't think that's true. We think we're going to lose. What Rothschilds did, one of, the, one of the five brothers, he said, okay, I'm going to dump my bonds out on the English market and I'm going to tell my friends. He, so he started having parties and people started coming around. Hey man, I don't, you don't want to be in, you don't want to be in uh, the English bond at this, at this point. They're losing the war. Napoleon's going to win. Napoleon's going to win. But in fact, Napoleon was losing. But he had that foreknowledge, dump all the bonds. The friend said, I'm not keeping these bonds. I'm dumping them on the market too. Behind closed doors, he was buying it up, buying it up, and all of a sudden, Napoleon lost the war! He lost the war! The British win! Yay! And Rothschild has come to say, well, <laughs> I got these bonds. You guys got to pay me. And you want to know, that was 1815. You want to know when they finished paying that off? Three years ago. Three years ago. Crazy. Scared people out of the market. They dumped and under behind closed doors, they begin to pick it up. Same thing is happening right now. Last year, JP Morgan Chase, Bitcoin is a fraud. If I find any of my employees trading in it, they're fired. We're gonna fire you. The government, well, Bitcoin is used by drug dealers. They use by stay out of it. But the evidence suggests in some of the top cryptographic and Bitcoin proponents in the space testified in court. Some of the biggest drug dealers who were selling drugs using Bitcoin were actually government agents. Scaring you out of the space for that hedge. But the SEC is trying to get in a position to put in a framework because we're still not out of the economic crisis. We're not out of the economic crisis just yet. They're trying to set up the infrastructure where you could save pension funds and you could save um, investment funds and retirement to put it into digital currencies. Because why? There's... It has to get worse before it gets better in terms of how the interest rates are being raised to, to reach some level of normalcy here. So the same Rothschild scare is being used all over again. But I don't want it to take two, 200 years for y'all to pay it back or be like the British and not even listen. But a lot of issues to be resolved around SEC and the taxation. Overview, quick overview here. Two tier, proof of stake. And we have a master node network where we pay the nodes in the network for providing protection to our blockchain. Um, at the same time, um, we reintroduce fungibility. We want to improve, and this is one of our main goals, and what you should think about, improving the user interfaces. We have a, a five-year partnership in place with the universities, with UCF, with the Office of Research and Commercialization. So it's the case, we issue out task orders. If there are any professors who want to engage in research and development activity with students, we're getting paid through the Office of Research and Commercialization to do some of that research around the user interfaces. Um, I know um, Dr. Smith used to do some research around uh, usability and acceptance testing for ATM machines. I know she's not. She was one of my professors too as, as well and that's one of the first persons I thought about in terms of ATM machines and doing some of that work and I know she was, she's out but um, that hopefully we'll be in contact real soon. Previous, um, contactless ATMs. We also want to provide better user experience and education to encourage use and mass adoption. When you look at this, we want to understand the systems that are in place about the technology, the blockchain itself, the economy, the economic systems to shape and reward behaviors. As psychologists, this is what you focus on. And also the community, how these different communities built. It's a case we have a, a, a community that's of 11,000 there actively engaged, 1,000 members who are on at any point in time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, talking about cryptocurrencies um, and, and talking particularly about our project. An experiment with incentive models in various industries. Right now we're in education, um, but then there are other spaces as well when you begin to talk about um, what's happening in the space. We want to deploy and develop competing models um, by using the master nodes within business and industry. Right now, MasterCard, or excuse me, Walmart is suing Visa 
because of, because of swipe fees. Kroger is suing Visa because of swipe fees. Every single day you have these very small micro micro aggressive attacks on economic sovereignty in terms of saying I'm I'll pay this five dollars or I'll pay this two dollars for the swipe I'll pay ten dollars to the bank for holding my money and they turn around and loan it out for seven eight percent you don't really fight that mom and pop shops at restaurants when if you're running the two two to three percent margin business and you're paying three percent out in swipes that's a killer but if it's the case that you have a master node that's backed that's backing a point of sale device instead of paying a network instead of paying a network to do swipes you now have a master node back point of sale device where that point of sale device is protecting the network and is getting paid in the cryptocurrency now it's zero fees and in some instances for paying taxes within local governments you can actually incentivize citizens to receive discounts and bonuses on their taxes to the degree that they're paying. So I think Seminole County is one of the first counties in the world to use cryptocurrency to pay taxes. But that's phenomenal when you think about all the ways in which cryptocurrencies can be used to change the business model. Think about the ways in which you can begin to incentivize and shape behavior using uh, cryptocurrencies, particularly in human capital management. It sucks when you're using a, a system that we know in psychology for a fact is inferior. When you're reinforcing behavior on a, a fixed interval schedule, every two weeks I get my paycheck, ding, ding. I'm not incentivized to work because I know every two weeks, no matter how much work I do, I'm gonna get the same paycheck. I can work very hard, I can work less, get the same thing. But we know that it, it is in fact, if you have continuous reinforcement, where you have smart contracts in place where it's using a smart contract, if certain behaviors are exhibited in the workplace, you can immediately reinforce that using cryptocurrencies. And we're much faster than the banks. Um, education, um, using cryptocurrencies to, for learning and skill acquisition, and also for the development of content. Right now, you all are students. What if we were able to provide ways in which you are able to get paid for learning? Which sounds crazy. We spend all this money, get all this loan money, pay for tuition, and at the end of the day, you still have to pay for your transcripts. But what if, but what if you could have a place where you got paid to learn? It's a 24-hour internship opportunity. That's, that's, these are some of the things that we're beginning to think about. When you go to conferences and you publish a paper, you publish that paper and just say, hey, I'm publishing a paper on light pay coin and cryptocurrencies. Um, you, will you pay for my trip? I say, give me your wallet address. Boom, you immediately get the funds. And, that, and I'm, I'm putting that out now. If you're publishing any papers on Light Paycoin, we pay for your travel to conferences. That's done. So I'm now going to talk about some aspects around the learning with one of our partners in which they are actually, they have se several master nodes in the network and they're beginning to put a lot of different programs in place to help the human factor students, psychology students, and even some business and engineering students as well in terms of AR work, augmented reality, and VR work, virtual reality based exercises. But he'll give a general description and then we can go from there. Thanks. Do you need something? Oh, I need a microphone. Wire me up. Cool. Did he? I think Damon got this put on. I have to do this myself. <laughs> Not so special. Um, so my name is Patrick Brennan. Um, I work for Lumina Datamatics. I'm an account development director there. I so D I realize we're pressed for time. I, Damon said that he has the gift of gab. I definitely have that too. I, I sort of spend my waking hours sort of bloviating in front of clients and potential clients and things like that. But you have something working in your favor this time that's going to stop me from doing that. And that's it. I just got over those anxiety dreams about being in college where like you haven't gone to a class for a long time and you suddenly remember that you like have a final exam coming up. So my terror is going to keep me uh, is going to keep me succinct, I think. So um, my parents don't really know what I do for a living. Right. My mom thinks that I'm in publishing. Uh, my dad uh, thinks I'm an idiot. <laughs> my uh, my brother thinks that I'm an editor. Uh, my wife thinks I'm like a media guy. And, and I'm sort of all of those things, right? Like I, I, I sort of play a lot of different roles and wear a lot of different hats. And I think that is kind of representative of the sort of work we do at Lumina Datamatics. We have a really wide footprint in the educational space. And I'm going to attempt to sort of boil that down into some 
pretty simple terminology. I like to think of us as a, as a learning agency, right? And what do I mean by that? A learning agency is a strategic partner to um, education companies, whether that means uh, universities and colleges, uh, publishers, sort of digital wild west online learning kind of folks. Um, and we provide a variety of services around content and technology solutions. Um, we also try to be the sort of go-to for our partners in terms of you know, sort of forward thinking, bleeding edge, technology solutions and things like that in the education space, which I think sort of speaks to our interest in Damon's Light Pay Coin uh, project. Here are some of the folks that we do that work for. Um, so, uh, this is a slide that I show every single person that I uh, talk to. So I don't know if you've ever heard any anybody like me talk before. You probably see the ubiquitous client icon slide. Um, hello. Trying to go forward here. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, like, why why does Lumina have an interest in light pay coin? Well, first of all, in the spirit of full disclosure, Dr. Bryan is our uh, chief learning scientist emeritus, right? He um, helped grow our assessment and analytics division uh, quite a bit, and so it, it seemed a natural fit when he moved on to um, his cryptocurrency project that we would sort of start talking about this. Blockchain technology is, is more around the, the potential um, applications in education for blockchain technology, right? So Damon said or alluded to in his presentation that one of the really neat things about the blockchain is that um, it allows users of applications that are developed on the blockchain to um, wholly own and keep private their data, right? And they, it's the nature of blockchain-based applications that users of those applications can expose that data to um, uh, you know, folks, who does, you know, folks who are interested in that data um, only if they're incentivized to do so, right? And um, one way of incentivizing folks to do that is to pay them, right? We know that uh, education is very, very expensive, right? Um, so the idea of um, the idea of obviating the cost of education through blockchain technology and cryptocurrency is something that we're deeply interested in studying. I'll talk a little bit about sort of how we do the stuff that we do. We we essentially have kind of three verticals that we like to um, that, that we sort of deploy um, in terms of helping our partners. Um, we're we're in the content space, which means we have. Uh, we bring a lot of folks to the table who are subject matter experts, writers and instructional designers, editors and things like that to um, help create content for learners. Um, we have in our institution subject matter expertise across educational disciplines. Um, we also, as I mentioned, uh, have developed a lot of enabling technology tools for uh, our internal teams, for our clients, and for collaboration between those different kinds of groups. And we have deep technology capabilities. Um, we do a lot of um, um, AI enhanced assessment, which I can talk further about. Um, we do student performance analytics. We build virtual reality and augmented uh, reality uh, solutions and applications. And you know, now recently we're, we're looking into decentralized education, blockchain-based platforms. Um, so, this is this sort of lists out the different projects that we're working on right now um, that we in an in an ideal world would um, open up in terms of you know being able to uh, deploy resources from universities in terms of creating uh, these projects, doing work on these projects and developing them, and also using these different products. Right. So we create online courses and learning objects. We create video and audio content and simulation-based learning, right, with that AR and VR technology. We also do a lot of um, a lot in the in, in terms of assessment. Um, we write a ton of assessment questions for educational publishers and universities and things like that. We also um, have developed a means by which to algorithmically generate assessment questions. Um, that's really interesting when folks are using adaptive platforms, need a really high number of questions or you know are very concerned about item security we also are looking into uh, or we do uh, quite a lot of work around uh, pre-admissions assessment and and related validation studies all of these things that you see listed here are um 
among the projects that we would like to uh, enlist sort of student help um, to create and um, you know to incentivize those folks uh, through the use of cryptocurrency and things like that. So that's pretty much my spiel about Lumina. So you want to keep going? Hey, you want me to go back? Sure. Uh, okay. So at this point, I'll, I'll I would I would appreciate very much if it's, we have individuals who are interested. In you. If you want to learn more, um, we're available after um, after this talk to discuss more details. But like I said before, if you're publishing and you get a paper published, um, we'll put the models out. We've already issued our first set of task orders for uh, designing the user interfaces for the user interfaces for the point of sale device. So if you're interested in being involved in that project, either as a professor or as a student then it's the case that we'll, we'll have the sign-ups through the Performance Solutions Group um, here at UC, here in the Psych Department. And also, any, anyone who would want to talk as well afterwards, um, we can discuss that. So I'll open up the floor for questions. We have about seven minutes. You're always that in front of the class. I am that, that guy. I'm that dude. Though. I ask a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. I was just curious, what departments within UCF are you working with? Because you mentioned some, um, some collaborative efforts going on already there. Sure. So right now, with in we're working with the psychology department. We started some initial discussions discussions with the business school, um, with the head of the fintech. The, the same uh, professor was actually mentioned in the article that we published not too long ago, um, because actually UCF will be the first program that I'm aware of that actually has a master's degree in fintech. The banking industry is already on its heels trying to catch up with what what's has been done, grown in the wild. So in financial technology. So fintech, financial technology. So if you're interested, um, just let us know. We're, we're looking to move into all of all of the colleges uh, across UCF. But our main focus is our my beachhead. I think in a sense is actually the psychology department working with human factors and the I know to do the ROI studies, to do the user interface studies as well. So that's how we're starting out first. Any other questions? Um, are you, do you have anything you could go on the web at the right minute and show us anything? Like you're talking about uh, improving uh, interfaces. And is there anything you can show us to kind of give an example of what you're talking about? We can take a minute if you look it up. So uh, I, can, I can quickly pull up a site here. I don't know if it makes sense to download a wallet, um, but a, the wallet sucks. The, let, let's do this hard wallet. Uh, Amazon. I should have actually brought my hard wallet so you can see it. Ledger Na Nano Cryptocurrency Wallet. This is nice little funky device where you have to put in these little clicker things. You, and first you have to memorize, or not memorize, or write down these 24 words, put these 24 words in, in order to create some randomness around the creation of your private key, you have to enter these 24 words, keep it in a, a very locked place or put it on a, a drive, and then now you're able to put in this eight digit code to get access to this piece of hardware that will store your Bitcoin, that will store your Litepay coin or any other cryptocurrency. But the main ones now for Legend Nano S is typically Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin. But it, it's very difficult. My grandma, my mom can't use this. And that's, that's really my test that you can get. My mom can use it, anybody can use it. So right now, my mom can't use that. Um, I want to be able to open up my phone at the end of the day and say, send my mom 100 Bitcoin, or send my mom 50 Bitcoin. That's taken in through the, the audio recording. Now it's able to send to her, yes, there's a confirmation of sending free light pay coin to your mother. Thank you. That's great. Um, right now I have a wallet on, on my phone, um, but it's the case, it's not the best wallet. Even though it's, it's a decent wallet for someone like myself who's somewhat computer savvy, but it's the case, people who don't know about these technologies, they're not, they're not touching it. It's not user friendly. Um, so it's one of the things all the way around the board. The, the cold wallet, the hard wallet that's on the, I'll, let, let me see if I can do it. I'm going to download this on your account. You're probably going to... Uh, not necessarily. Probably won't let you. Okay. Respond. Yeah, but it's a desktop wallet, and it's not the most user friendly. So these user interfaces, I think, one of the things that we can improve all the way around the board.
Yeah, I'm curious like, how, how the company that you are with, how, you, how would you um, manage a, a or somebody? How would you do it? How would you, uh, let's say somebody here got involved and, and you did some research and said, look, here's a better way to do this. I mean, um, who may, I don't know who makes these. I don't know who makes these things, and I don't know who. Do that yeah, at the end of, end of the day, the first task order is dealing with software. So the first task order that we have out is the production of wireframes in terms of how a user interface should look. Being able to send that documentation with us, then and also a team being able to do OOD, the object-oriented analysis. And so you have your own, every company has their own way of handling this, is, 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 is their own interfaces, basically? Like your competitors would have their own interfaces for... What happened, the cryptocurrency space is primarily a fork of Bitcoin, and that includes the wallets. So you have wallets that are like almost 10 years old. User interfaces haven't changed at all because everybody's a fork of Bitcoin in some variation. So it needs to be a total switch, of a pivot, okay. to make the user interfaces much better. Okay. And in terms of that, we'd also like to share in the intellectual property. So if you publish, it's the case you have a university and our team as well. If we develop it together, I think we should share it. I don't think it should be something that we just cordon off and say, oh, it's ours. Mm -hmm. No, it's closed off, but be able to share in some sense in terms of what you develop at the same time. Also, there are opportunities not only to be engaged with the technology, but also the economy in terms of how we set up our incentive systems around things we, we're trying to get people to do. And the community as well. I I guarantee you, if two or three of you show up on a Discord, you're going to get more questions of that. You're a UCF student? Oh, so cool! I want to ask you about. I want to ask you about interfaces. Tell me about how you're going to prove ABCD. But it's one of the things. It's it's iterative. And you like to have more questions. If somebody, if somebody else has a question, you you can ask it now. But if not, I'm going to keep asking questions because <laughs> it's helpful. So, um, the stuff you're doing with ORC, what is, there, is something going to get published out of the work you're? collaborating with them, or is that just so, to design um, something applied for them? Or sure. For, for ORC, I, we've approached them, and we have a, a master level agreement, and we issue task orders, and each of the task orders, we can begin to tailor and design um, the, the specific task orders to meet the needs of yourself. Like, say, for instance, you want to be able to kick off a specific project, not necessarily related to anything that we, we're doing, but yet you know that it will have an impact because of your experience in the space. Well, it's shot the task order, so ORC actually has a record of it. And students are able to get paid, they can voice us, and then we list out one of the things that we were able to share. Um, so we can, we can tailor that to your particular case. Any conferences, if you're, if you're able to publish or if you're able to do presentations and you want travel, we'll, we'll, we'll spread out of the way. Only thing I would ask is that you'd have to sign up on coinbase.com in order to receive the Bitcoin, and then it goes into your bank account. And that would take, who knows, because, well, for, for me, it's only one day to go from cryptocurrencies into fiat. Um, but because the bank that I belong to, um, it's a military bank that actually made the investment into Coinbase, and they're very progressive. On my on my bank on my bank application, it says Coinbase wallet. So now I have a Coinbase wallet in my bank account, which is kind of weird. People are it's it's happening, but we just have to be aware of it. And I, I hope that everyone would want to be involved. I just want to sure. So so the desktop based wallets. <coughs> The phone based, you know, smartphone based wallets or like the uh, actual hard wallets are, are the software based wallets then less secure or are they all just as secure at this point? Um, some of the, and, and security now is to, at the point where the technology is solved with the hardware wallets and also with the soft, the soft wallets on the desktop or the, the medium or warm wallets. But the, what's happening now is the technology is so difficult to hack that the hackers now are sophisticated enough to engage in social engineering. Now, on the Discord, they'll say, hey, um, they'll change their avatar to be my avatar. And then they'll say, hey, you need, and somebody will say, oh, I need help setting up my master node. And the next thing you know, they say, I'll help you. And they have my avatar. They've taken a copy of my avatar and said, oh, yeah, I'm creating a new project. Um, I, here's what I need you to do. I need for you to dump your uh, wallet log file and post it. Next thing you know, they post their, their, their log files in the wallet, they steal the private keys, and as soon as that person launches their desktop wallet, they'll find that they have over $4,000 of cryptocurrency stolen, gone, because they've been socially engineered. And, and that's another issue that yeah, needs to be definitely from a challenge. challenge. Uh, and exactly. So that's another area where we're doing, on our webinars weekly, we talk about social engineering every time. So the hot wallet, the hardware, is more secure, but if you lose that... If you lose the code, it's gone. You lose that little piece of 
jump drive, it looks like it's gone. You lose the jump drive, yeah, it's gone. gone. You it's lose gone. your your um your, your twenty four <laughs> word encryption is gone. So all right. Well, I,